Who's that? Zbig Brzezinski. Zbigniew Brzezinski was counselor for strategic and, uh, and international studies, professor of American foreign policy of Johns Hopkins, national security advisor to President Jimmy Carter, trustee and founder of the Trilateral Commission, member of the Council on Foreign Relations, international advisor to several major cor corporations, associate of Henry Kissinger, also worked for Ronald Reagan in intelligence capacities co-chairman of the Bush National Security Advisory Task Force in 1988. What a guy. Z -Bay. Now, if you want to get really, 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 really angry, go buy this book. It's called The Grand Chessboard. American Primacy and its Geostrategic Objectives. Written by Zbigniew Brzezinski in 1997. I'm going to read you some quotes from that book. Page XII, it's the very first words in the book. The last decades of the 20th century has witnessed a tectonic shift in world affairs. For the first time ever, a non-Eurasian power has emerged not only as a key arbiter of Eurasian power relations, but also as the world's paramount power, the defeat and collapse of the Soviet Union was the final step in the rapid ascendance of a Western Hemisphere power, the United States, as the sole and indeed the first truly global superpower. Page XII, it's in the preface. But in the meantime, he says, it is imperative that no Eurasian challenger, Eurasia is everything in between roughly east of Germany all the way to the Pacific Ocean, south through the Indian subcontinent includes the Middle East. It's imperative that no Eurasian challenger, by that he means Russia or China, emerges capable of dominating Eurasia and thus of also challenging America. The formulation of a comprehensive and integrated Eurasian geostrategy is therefore the purpose of this book, Geostrategy, Eurasia. The attitude of the American public toward the external projection of American power has been much more ambivalent. The public supported America's engagement in World War II largely because of the shock effect of the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Gets worse. For America, the chief geopolitical prize is Eurasia. Now a non-Eurasian power, that's us, is preeminent in Eurasia and America's global primacy, isn't that arrogant? America's global primacy is directly dependent on how long and how effectively its preponderance on the Eurasian continent is sustained. What he's saying is, is that if the U.S. wants to stay top dog, we have to control Eurasia. America's withdrawal from the world, withdrawal from the world or because of the sudden emergence of a successful rival, would produce massive international stability. It would prompt global anarchy. You know what he's saying there? Yeah, a little global anarchy would probably be a damn good thing right now. Um, what he's saying there is, if we don't control the world by whatever means necessary, the world's going to be miserable. He didn't ask my opinion. Did he ask yours? Okay. In that context, how, how America manages Eurasia, do we manage people around the world? Is that our job? Is critical. Eurasia is the globe's largest continent and is geopolitically axial. A power that dominates Eurasia would control two of the world's three most advanced and economically productive regions. A mere glance at the map also suggests that control over Eurasia would almost automatically entail Africa's subordination. <laughs> rendering the Western Hemisphere and Oceania, that's Australia, for all of you non-academics, geopolitically peripheral to the world's central continent. About 75% of the world's people live in Eurasia, and most of the world's physical wealth is there as well, both in its enterprises and underneath its soil. Eurasia accounts for 60% of the world's GNP and three-fourths of, three of the world's known energy resources. 
Two basic steps are thus required. First, to identify the geostrategically dynamic Eurasian states that have the power to cause a potentially important shift in the international distribution of power and to decipher the central external goals of their respective political elites and the likely consequences of their seeking to attain them. Second, to formulate specific U.S. policies to offset, co-opt, and or control the above. The man is talking about co-opting, controlling, managing, subverting nations and peoples and economies. To put it in a terminology that harkens back to the more brutal age of ancient empires, the three grand imperatives of imperial, listen to this, of imperial geostrategy are to prevent collusion and maintain security dependence among the vassals, to keep tributaries pliant and protected, and to keep the barbarians from coming together. That's on page 40. I'm telling you, you've got to buy the book. Now we get really serious. On page 95, Uzbekistan, with its much more ethnically homogeneous population of approximately 25 million and its leaders emphasizing the country's historic glories, has become increasingly assertive in affirming the region's new post-colonial status. He, see, he saw the first step in this as diminishing the ability of Russia to reassert the dream of the Soviet Union, all the stands in Central Asia were once part of the Soviet Union. The borders were drawn arbitrarily by Lenin and Stalin. And he saw one of the most important steps was to prevent Russia from asserting any control in the region, which we did. You know how we did it? Over the last decade, thanks to Goldman Sachs, the Harvard Endowment, the U.S. Treasury and the Federal Reserve, the World Bank, we looted $300 billion out of the Russian economy. Three hundred billion dollars. I was there. The Russian population was, what, 160, 64 million at the fall of the Soviet Union. The population of Russia is today 145 million. By, in, in another 10 years, it will be 130 million. The average life expectancy of a male in Russia has dropped to 48 years. Thanks to the economic devastation, the ruin we visited on their economy, it was a deliberate plan to weaken Russia so that it couldn't challenge our move into Eurasia a decade later. But it helps if you see this on the map. Okay, Russia, Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, and China. Now, the proposed oil route is from here to here, 1,500 miles. China can't build it because it's 5,000 miles, and they don't have the technology to build it. We do, thanks to a company named Halliburton, Halliburton, which was uh, chaired with the CEO, was Dick Cheney, right? Okay, they're, they're, they're probably going to build the pipeline. Okay, so now that you see this relationship, what he's saying is you build a block starting with Islamic fundamentalism, which we supported and created, to keep Russia from moving south to reassert control, but then you build up these countries so that they're so powerful, and with a weakened Russia, Russia can't make a move to control, and all the oil reserves are right in here. Okay? And he, we have effectively made China uh, dependent upon our technology because they need the oil desperately. Now, it was Uzbekistan nationally the most vital and the most populous of the Central Asian states represents the major obstacle to any renewed Russian control over the region. Its dependence is critical to the survival of other Central Asian states and is the least vulnerable to Russian pressures. Where was the first place that President Bush announced we were sending troops after the attacks on September 11th? We were already there. we have been training Uzbeki troops for more than five years. Referring to an area he calls the Eurasian Balkans in a 1997 map in which he circled the exact location now remember, this is a book written four years ago. And I'm going to show you a map where Zbigniew Brzezinski said 
the next world conflict was going to take place. Afghanistan, Iran, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan. This is where he said four years ago, the United States, in order to sustain its precarious, that's my words, economy, would have to control that to maintain its role as the global superpower and to become the world's only superpower. The rule, in effect, the, the ruling nation of the world. That's his map from four years ago. Referring to an area he calls the Eurasian Balkans and a 97 map in which he circled the exact location of the current conflict, describing it as the central region of pending conflict for world dominance, Brzezinski writes, moreover, that they, the Central Asian republics, are of importance from the standpoint of security and historical ambitions to at least three of their most immediate and more powerful neighbors, namely Russia, Turkey, and Iran, with China also signaling an increasing geopolitical interest in the region. And he really lets his hair down. More important as a potential economic prize, an enormous concentration of natural gas and oil reserves is located in the region in addition to important minerals including gold. Didn't know about the gold, did you? The world's energy consumption is bound to vastly increase over the next two or three decades. Estimates by the U.S. Department of Energy anticipate that world demand will rise by more than 50% between 1993 and 2015, with the most significant increase in consumption occurring in the Far East, China. The momentum of Asia's economic development is already generating massive pressures for the exploration and exploitation of new sources of energy in the Central Asian region, and the Caspian Sea Basin are known to contain reserves of natural gas and oil that dwarf those of Kuwait, the Gulf of Mexico, and the North Sea. Once pipelines to the area have been developed, Turkmenistan's truly vast natural gas reserves augur a prosperous future. He's talking about the pipelines. Without sustained and directed American involvement before long, the forces of global disorder, global disorder? You mean democracy? <laughs> Global disorder could come to dominate the world scene, and the possibility of such a fragmentation is inherent in the geopolitical tensions not only of today's Eurasia, but of the world more generally. The most immediate task is to make certain that no state or combination of states gains the capacity to, to expel the United States from Eurasia, or even, to or even to diminish significantly its decisive arbitration role. In the long run, Global politics are bound to become increasingly uncongenial to the concentration of hege hegemonic power in the hands of a single state. Hence, America is not only the first as well as the only truly global superpower, but is also likely to be the very last. And what does he say that's going to happen? He says that the United States will fold into a one world government in which all nations will cease to exist run by corporations. I'm paraphrasing it. Now, hold your breath. Very last pages in the book. Moreover, as America becomes an increasingly multicultural society, it may find it more difficult to fa fashion a consensus on foreign policy issues except in the circumstance of a truly massive and widely perceived direct external threat. Read it again, she said. Maybe I should read this with a German accent. <laughs> Wait a minute. Moreover, as America becomes an increasingly multicultural society, it may find it more difficult to fashion a consensus on foreign policy issues, except in the circumstance of a truly massive and widely perceived direct external threat. 